those of you that are joining us from Asia, and welcome to this very special We Working Women event in celebration of Asian Heritage Month. The event today is titled Finding Strength in Our Heritage, Leading Diversity in the Workplace. And we've got four outstanding women professionals that are here to join us and share their stories and insights. Um, I'm just going to ask each of them to wave as I call out their names. So today we have with us Cassie Chung, who is founder and CEO of Next Intelligence. Hi, Kathy. Welcome. Ashley, we have that are here to me. join us Thanks for being and share here. their stories. We've got insight. Helen Pung, um, I'm just who is vice president of, of wait, talent acquisition like and development. At so today we have with us Cassie Chung, who Hello. is founder and Hi. CEO. We of have Next Sharon Wu, who is a news producer Hi, at Welcome. CBC. Hey, Ashley. Thank you hey, everyone. Thanks for yeah, and that's Canadian Broadcasting Corporation for those of you that may not be familiar with Canada. And we have Mona Zhang, who's Portfolio Manager at Mackenzie Investments. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much to the four of you for joining us today. So on the topic of Asian Heritage Month, um, in 2002, the Canadian government declared the month of May as Asian Heritage Month to celebrate and recognize diversity and the contributions of Asian Canadians. In 2016, in Canada, um, the Asian Canadians made up about 17.7% of Canada's population. However, um, I think anecdotally, a lot of us hear that even though we see a lot more representation of Asian Canadians in the workplace and in the media, there are still bottlenecks and the issues and challenges that we face in the professional world and in the workplace. So it's um, a really special opportunity to have the four of you here that are coming from all different industries and very diverse backgrounds to share your insights with us today. Um, we Working Women is North America's largest platform for Chinese women's professional development. A lot of us know each other already through different We Working Women events and some of the We Working Women subscribers, there are now 100,000 of them and the number is growing, are also familiar with you and your stories. So I want to warmly welcome you and thank you for being here with us. Now, um, just before we break open to our conversation and our self introductions, I think everyone is cognizant that over the last year we've seen a dramatic rise in anti Asian hate and anti Asian sentiment. Um, in fact, in the Canadian context, um, Vancouver was cited by a few major media outlets as being a hotspot for reported incidents of anti Asian hate. So I think it will be really interesting for us to not only talk about Asian heritage, how do we find our strength, how do we lead in a multicultural society, but how do we also um, try to confront and manage the hate and negative sentiments that are existing. So the objective today is to highlight you and your stories as examples. And what I'd like to ask you each to do is introduce to our audience who you are, your name, your profession, the type of work that you do. And maybe you can also tell us your connection to your Asian heritage in a very brief way before we break out. So I'd like to invite Kathy to first introduce herself. Sure. Um, my name is Kathy. I came to Canada uh, exactly 20 years ago uh, from Shanghai. Um, I am a market researcher for 20 plus years um, in Asia. Um, most of the work um, was international. So uh, and in Canada, a lot of the work is multicultural. So it's essentially the same thing. Culture always plays a big role in understanding people. So I have had a lot of pleasure trying to understand that. I think that's probably a, a connection here today. Um, five years ago, I started my own company pursuing um, using technology to understand people better, deeper, faster. So I can talk a, a little bit more about that later. But uh, essentially, um, I have, I'm very happy to have this opportunity to talk about this very important topic today. Thank you. Welcome, Kathy. Thank you so much. And with that, let me jump to Sharon. Hi everyone, my name is Sharon Wu. I came to Canada in 2005 after I graduated from uh, uh, UK and uh, then um, um, I have been working my entire career over 20 years in media. So for some people who switch jobs, switch career, that's something that really sounds daunting to me. I've never had this experience. So in China I had worked for um, a television station there as a reporter and host. And then I came to Canada, I worked for a uh, Chinese uh, television station as a host. Then I uh, jumped to uh, uh, 
uh, multilingual language television station until one year after I landed, I uh, got a job in CBC. So I've been working for CBC as a producer for 15 years, uh, producing news and the current affairs and the documentaries. And uh, one thing that I'm really, really interested in is how to uh, take our audience to different perspectives and a different um, ethnicity background and then to uh, different cultures because after all, um, you know, Canada is a very, very multicultural uh, society Then we really need to reflect, our programming needs to reflect our society and our uh, people as well. Great, thank you so much, Sharon. Thanks for being here and I'll jump to Helen. Hi, hello everyone. Good morning, good evening. Uh, my name is Helen Peng. Uh, I'm the Vice President of Talent Acquisition and Development for Sun Life. Uh, Sun Life is actually one of the biggest global companies who specialize in insurance and asset and wealth management. So I was born in uh, a remote town in Heilongjiang province, and I moved to Canada 22 years ago, so it's been a long time. I came to uh, Montreal, in fact, to do my MBA at McGill University. Then I fell in love with the city, so I stayed. Um, 17 years gone by, um, I realized um, it's almost the same amount of time I spent in my hometown, so I consider my second hometown. I uh, moved to Toronto uh, four years ago, so right now I'm staying in Toronto, love, loving everything except the, the housing price. Um, I've been in human resources for 20 years, so I have to say I have accumulated tremendous learning experiences. And one of my passions is actually mentor and coach people in need, especially visible minorities and women, just like myself, because I know uh, how hard it is um, for us um, Asians to overcome a lot of um, barriers and find our path in North America. Um, in my spare time, I actually, I am a avid amateur photographer and I enjoy playing golf with my husband when I can, not during COVID, but the news is I can go out tomorrow because Ontario is open tomorrow. <laughs> Great news. Great for those I know. <laughs> for those of us in Ontario. And finally, last but not least, Mona. Um, hello, everybody. I'm Mona Jung. Um, good morning and good evening. I am a portfolio manager um, at McKinsey Investments. McKinsey is one of the largest leading independent mass and managers in Canada. Um, as a portfolio manager, what we do is we buy and sell stocks and hopefully to preserve and grow our clients' capital. Um, also, in my spare time, I'm involved in this charity called Educating Girls of Rural China. It is a Canadian registered charity aimed to help girls from underprivileged families in Canada, in, in China. I enjoy every minute of it. And also teach um, um, value investment courses at Rama School of Management, OT. Um, personally, I actually as a kid, I enjoy writing very much and I won actually a few um, writing competitions. So I've always thought if I'm, I'm not a professional um, investor, I'd probably become a journalist or a writer of some thought. So as in terms of background, I actually was born and raised in Beijing. Um, I came to Canada 12 years ago to pursue my MBA. So ever since graduation, I've been working in the asset management industry um, for 10 years and counting. And over to you, Ashley. Oh, thank you. Thank you to the four of you for your excellent introductions and sharing a little bit of your past. And once again, um, We Working Women being this very special global network was founded in Canada. And I think that's why all of us have this We Working Women connection as well as this Canada connection. And it's so wonderful to be able to all be together, um, albeit virtually. So for today's discussion, I'd like to kick off by getting your views on how you feel about being a woman professional of Asian heritage in today's society. And specifically the question that I want to pose to start our conversation today are, um, what are your thoughts on stereotypes like being the model minority? Are there pros and cons and how do you see the pros and cons of this? And maybe let's start with Sharon. I mean, you have so many years of experience in media and storytelling. Um, maybe you can tell us your thoughts. Yeah, I would say the model minority is a myth, right? So not until um, a lot of times, like for the, for decades, this has been used in the, as a mask for people who are, you know, trying to um, silence others, 
Southern Asians especially, and think this is the way that、uh, you guys should continue doing because look at your high achievers. You are、uh, very successful. Your social economic pretty in a very comfortable status in North America, and、uh, you are well educated and you are hardworking. And then most importantly, you do not complain. The last part you do not complain is the secret to mouth us to not let people. Um, you know, to speak out, and that's something that I think Asians should be working on. With all the positive stereotypes, that there comes with the negative stereotypes, and that is the you know, be quiet. You know, as long as there is no life and that situation, you just endure everything, tough it out, and、uh, eventually you will. We we believe that eventually, as long as you hard work, eventually you will be accepted. However, a lot of things happened in recent in recent years, during the COVID, during、uh, you know Atlanta shootings. I'll make it's a kind of wake up call for a lot of people that realize that this is actually not enough to be just a modern minority is not enough, and then we need to break down this stereotype, and we need to speak out, we need to be communicating with society, we need to voice ourselves, we need to not be. Invisible anymore. So I think there's a lot of work needs to be done. And first of all, then we need to re-examine the concept concept of minority、uh, model minority, not just only being proud of ourselves being called as a model minority, but also look into what it exactly means. Yeah, what a timely message. Well, let's turn to Helen because Helen, as you mentioned, you have. Over 20 years working in in human resources and HR, and, and you're also seeing how does this model minority become portrayed in the professional field in the workplace? What are what are your thoughts on the stereotype and its pros and cons? Yeah, thank you, Ashley, and I couldn't agree with the, with Sarah more on some of the stereotype like hardworking, right? And I remember there's one、uh, American actress, Margaret Cho. Um, she's actually with Korean descent, right? She, in one of her stand-up comedy, she actually said,、um, "Calling an Asian lazy is actually the biggest insult because we're all considered, right, a hardworking、um, group."、Um, and another stereotype that you mentioned, and I think everybody, so, some sort of hearing、um, that type of statement is, we're really good at academically, right? We're good academic, especially math and science. Um, I still remember when I first started my HR career.、Um, I actually start with compensation, and someone would say, "Oh, she's Chinese. She must be good with numbers."、Um, so that's the typical stereotype. As a matter of fact, I am pretty good with numbers. <laughs> But you can actually see right through that example to see how people actually think.、Um, from the field of professions, there's also stereotype that we can see. You know, Asians are more seen like. Good at with、uh, good at finance、uh, or investment banking or IT, you know something with system, not not necessary with people. So we're seen as lacking a bit of soft skills or communication or、um, leadership skills. In fact, I think there's a research when we look at the CEOs in North America since the 60s, there are 5,000 of them, and、um, uh, only 41 were actually Asian. CEOs and they were saying it's only the 0.8 percent of CEOs. So that's also a part of like a stereotype saying we're lacking leadership skills. So all those are definitely the stereotype. But you know there are good good stereotypes as well, right? When we're saying you know all these we're trustworthy. People always say you know if you give some task to the Asian descent and they're saying they're gonna deliver high quality work as well. So they're A combination of different stereotypes for the model minority. Yeah, it's, it's super interesting. It's a lot for I think everyone to be processing in these times. And with that, I want to turn to Kathy because I mean you have done twenty years, and you you've called it multicultural marketing, right? And you've really seen like also not just what's happening in the workplace, but how we're looking at Asians as consumers, and and you've been an entrepreneur. Um, so, how have you managed your ethnic identity as a professional in your field, and has it been an obstacle? Has it has it been an asset? I want to think maybe it's an asset because you got into multicultural marketing. But let's hear from you. 
I think it's very interesting um, when you ladies said um, Asians are good at math. Um, I'm pretty bad at math, so I'm probably <laughs> zero time, which probably is a blessing um, because uh, I feel like um, my career path, at least, um, I have not had the um, the opportunity to really behave in my Asian way. Um, sometimes it's good, sometimes it's not so good, um, but um, I think. Um, especially um, with the opportunity of doing multicultural marketing, um, it broadens your perspectives, I find. Um, it's no longer just Asian, non-Asian. Um, it has a lot of different perspectives. Um, it can be a 10-year perspective, how long you've been in a new country, for example. A lot of times, regardless of where you come from or your backgrounds, um, how soon, how new you are to a new country can define your purchase decisions in our world for marketing. So I think um, uh, somehow I feel like I try as a researcher, which is something that I really enjoy, uh, I try to have this more objective view of people, looking at people more, um, try to break the um, the a black and white kind of uh, separation. Um, I think I do quite identify with um, uh, recently a lot of people are talking about this otherness. Uh, it's like um, me versus other. Um, so I think that, yeah, uh, very thankful to the work that I do. Um, gives me a lot of opportunity to re reflect on people as individuals or people as just a whole human being race kind of. So um, probably this is a little, too far away from the question you asked, Ashley. Uh, so back to my personal experience, um, I think overall my ethnicity is a plus, obviously, uh, because um, people have the impression that you're a researcher, but you're also Chinese, that you have access to that community. You intuitively understand the community. So that gives me the advantage of uh, leading that kind of work. But I think it's a, I would also look at it um, that's probably just more of an um, extrinsic kind of view, but also internally. Um, I feel like internally I may feel uh, less good about that. Um, very often I find um, I'm being very conscious of me being uh, not part of the mainstream, for example. Especially in my world, uh, marketing, it is still very much uh, like a less penetrated by newcomers, for example. Um, so I think these two combined, uh, it's just um, very often it's an opportunity to reflect, to think about um, different kinds of uh, views. Um, yeah, so the, uh, probably too long an answer, but a short answer to that is um, I think it's a, it's a mix. Sometimes it's a, it's a blessing, sometimes um, it's a hurdle. Right. And and since we've been talking about like being a visibility minority and we've also been talking about math and everyone thinks we're being so good at math, I think we should turn to Mona, um, who's been in the finance industry for, for so long. So her math has got to be great. And Mona, um, tell us about your experience and maybe you even have um, some incidences or stories you could share with us about how your ethnicity has played a part in your professional life. Yeah, sure, Ashley. I feel like I'm a bad example here because I, I am good at math and I'm in finance, a typical stereotype for like uh, Asian girls. <laughs> but I mean, I, want, I do want to tell a story because um, as you may know that I work in a very um, white male dominant industry and you know that that, that makeup of, um, of people can be really overwhelming. I had first hand experience even when I was in school at Rockman. I remember there was a second year networking event. It was very important, you know, this second year. And I walk into the, the event place and I feel the whole place was just like a boys club. Like all the guys were, were chatting, telling jokes and drinking beer and discussing hockey, which I knew nothing about. So imagine like an Asian girl with big glasses at the time and also like awkward English. I, was, I felt like it was completely out of place. So that was actually really frustrating, but also a pivotal moment in my life. So I decided to do something different. So instead of trying to become someone else, I go back to my root and think about, okay, what am I good at? Um, so I did my undergrad in, in engineering. So apparently I know tech. And secondly, I'm from China. So I know how the business environment was, was like in, in back, back home. So I, maybe I could do something combined the two. Um, luckily there was an opportunity um, towards the second year, towards graduation actually. There was a research company called Muddy Waters. At the time they were publishing tons of reports 
short, um, short selling Chinese companies, accusing them of, of fraud and, and fabricating financial reports, etc. And they were actually t- um, um, writing about a company called Spectrum Communications. It is a semiconductor business in, in China. I won't go into the details. Um, long story short, I was beyond mad because you know what? I own the stock and the stock tanked. So, so I thought, like, okay, I need not to be a client Asian. I need to do something about it. So I decided to pick up the pen and start writing articles on Seeking Alpha, which is an investor's blog. Um, you know what? I was doing a lot of research, laying out all the evidence, and it turned out muddy water was wrong. So the stock um, uh, recovered most of its value within three months after I published my articles. So that was the turnaround story I had, and, and I kind of earned myself a name for 15 minutes. And also that landed a job, um, landed me a job at one of the top firms, um, top investment firms in Toronto. So if you ask me how do I manage the challenges or the stereotypes, I think one thing is I learned from, from my experience that you sort of have to go back to who you are and really accept it that you are good at something and try to be better at it instead of trying to be someone else and, and fitting in. You know, I'm a portfolio manager now. We manage over $14 billion. I don't know anything about hockey. <laughs> I can't. <laughs> Sorry, if I can just back up right a now. Bit. Yeah, if I can, I completely agree with you, Mona. And uh, we, I think, it's coming in the faces as an immigrant, as an Asian girl, coming to this new, completely different culture, different language, uh, country. That you, you have this self awareness that you want to be one of them as soon as possible and you don't want to be out of place so you try to mimicking the way they talk the way they behave whatever hobbies they they talk about whatever uh, tv shows you for me it's it's all about the culture part and i need to pick it up and i give myself so much pressure to pick it up and then eventually i realized you know what a lot of people asking me questions outside of their culture because they are curious as well so and I think I need to be more prepared that I have a different pockets whenever I ask people talk to me in this different ways that I have you know something to offer. So and especially my go back to my roots that part I think that's also over time is a confidence that grows. Once once you have one little success and that little success leads to more success and more success and then you build up this 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 confidence then you really don't don't worry about who you know talk about behind you or who thinks you are because you know who you are, right? So I I, I think it's, it's a process, at least five to six years that for newcomers, we need to totally. endure that, we need to find a way, we need to be rooted in this country and then grow confidence. And then, you know, I just to be from being uh, shy to being proud of ourselves or to be more, uh, you know, open to everyone. Totally. Yeah. Fabulous. Sorry, Go Helen. Ahead, no, no, I was just saying these uh, these ladies said it beautifully, and I think um, you know um, from my experience, I'm just going to offer you know uh, from another angle to layer on what they have said. Right? Um, I've heard a lot of people actually said, "I didn't get that promotion because I'm Asian. I didn't get that job because I'm Asian. Right? I didn't get this because of that." So I, I want to alert also them saying that might be true for to a certain extent, but there might be more to it, right? Do you have enough experiences? Have you learned all the skills that needed for that job or that promotion? Have you done, you know, uh, a lot of proactive problem solving with your boss? Have you built relationships with that? So there are many, many factors that might lead to a conclusion. So I don't want people to attribute right some of the result only to um, our descent. So that's one thing I want to you know kind of with some of my colleagues. Um, and from my personal experience, it's these part can be both can be barrier, but also can be your asset. The focus how you turn a barrier into an asset. So example, a personal example, I was in Montreal. When I first arrived in Montreal, I didn't speak French. I didn't speak a word of French. My first word was Aloué, not even bonjour or Mexi, right? Because Aloué is like, you needed some uh, place for rent, right? I needed a place to stay. And uh, I started working. Um, I can use English to get by because during 
the work time English universal language, you can use that. But during lunchtime, everyone is speaking French. And I couldn't participate. I couldn't understand. I had no idea what they're talking about. I felt miserable. So that was my barrier. Because I, I can't, you know, bingo in, I can't be part of them, right? Um, I had two choices. One, be miserable. Two, learn French. So I actually said, um, raised my hand to my boss at the moment. I said, I want to give up all my vacation this year and some unpaid leave. I want to do a French immersion. And he was ecstatic. He was francophone, super proud of the uh, heritage as well. So I went to Quebec City, um, stay with a family who didn't speak a word of English. So I stayed in their basement for seven weeks. I went to language school during the daytime and I played with the kids and cooking with the family after. So that's how I started speaking French. And the beauty of that story is my boss was actually said, Helen, I support you, but if you come back, your French improves tremendously. I'm going to give you back your vacation. Guess what? They gave me back my vacation. So that's a story to say, yes, you may have a barrier, but if you're determined enough to change that barrier into something more of an asset, you know, that's going to help you tremendously. It's going to open doors and it's going to make you actually see a lot of things you haven't been able to see in a new culture. And now I'm in Toronto. This is definitely, my French is definitely my asset. So that's kind of the, the point I want to make. How not to focus on your very only and how smartly learn and change that into an asset. Wow. I mean, those are all some really <laughs> inspiring, some super inspiring stories. And you guys are obviously dynamo women and professionals. And I, I want to kind of ask you the question, like, look, look, can we talk a little bit about where does that strength come from? Because um, really interestingly, the four of you have all shared that you didn't start your academic careers and professional formation in Canada. Like you all had really big hurdles like language and culture and, and different things, um, hockey and maybe, maybe not being good at math to deal with. And where do you get that strength? Like, do you find that your heritage, I mean, we can say Asian heritage in this case, um, we tend to all be of Chinese descent in this, in this particular conversation. Do you find strength in that heritage? And maybe I'll first start with Kathy and if anyone wants to chime in, let us know. Um, I definitely think there is some strength in our heritage. I probably will say endurance. Um, there was a research paper from a UK company. Um, it's more about education. They did a research uh, between uh, Asian kids. I believe it was Asian or Chinese kids, I can't remember, and kids in the UK. Um, they gave them math um, problems to solve. Basically, those were no answers, impossible to solve. Um, they observed the two groups of kids, how they uh, de dealt with the, the problem. So what they learned was um, um, the Asian, the Asian or Chinese kids, they just stay there forever. They wouldn't get, get up. While the kids from the UK, after a while, they figured it's a waste of time. Why do you even do that? So they stood up, they, they left. So the conclusion of the report was that because a lot of, uh, uh, there's a lot of uh, belief, at least um, Asians are better with math. Like I'm an exception. <laughs> there, is a, there, there, there is a lot of belief in that. Uh, so their conclusion is probably it's not necessarily that they're better at math. They're probably just more endurant somehow in the culture. It's part of that. So I do like this part very, very much because uh, I spent a lot of time trying to understand the deepest uh, level of um, cultural imprint on people on how we do things, how we say things, how we why we prefer this versus others. Um, culture plays a significant role. Uh, so endurance, in my mind, um, is a perspective that most of the Western cultural models do not have. For example, I don't know if you guys are a big fan of those cultural models from Hofstede, for example, the Dutch person. Um, yeah, so his dimension has uh, indulgence, for example, um, but it's about to what extent you are indulgent versus less indulgent. But um, I would think if you bring the Asian perspective in, the full spectrum should be maybe one end, it's indulgence, the other end is endurance. Um, so mm -hmm. I do think this is probably one um, aspect, I think hearing Yulei's stories, 
yeah, I, I, I do feel very um, proud of that. I think uh, it definitely helped me um, overcome some of the difficulties uh, in my career. Um, actually, my, I may can jump in here because um, that's a really interesting question. Because um, actually, I was talking about this particular topic with our CIO the other day during a work meeting. You know, we're having this team meeting where because everybody has to work from home. And she just mentioned she had a meeting like two weeks ago with our Hong Kong colleagues, and they were all kind of staying in the same office and the same conference room. Guess what? There was no lockdown in Hong Kong. So we're just talking about all the differences, how we handle the pandemic differently. So based on my experience, I think there's more, there's a stronger emphasis on collectivism, on thinking about others in generally Chinese or Asian cultures. Whereas I think in Canada, individual, individualism is more kind of encouraged. Um, I just feel like growing up, I've always been taught that you have to think about others. You have to think about your impact on other people and then think about your own freedom and, and, and all the others. Um, I find it actually really helpful because when you're in a team setup, it's not about you um, being successful or not. It's about whether the team can thrive and also about whether um, in a community, in a company, everybody can do better together. And that's kind of McKenzie's um, um, a logo. But I actually believe that. And I think that's a strength coming from an Asian culture. And especially in this very turbulent times, having the idea of collaborating together, being more inclusive. I think Asian culture has a really set a really good example on that. May I, I add on that? I just can't help myself because that's just a topic that I'm super excited about. Uh, individualism versus collectivism, I do agree. I think this pandemic is almost like um, a live case study to understand uh, culture. Uh, but I really strongly believe beyond individualism, uh, collectivism, it is endurance that sets us apart. Asia apart from, from uh, Western societies. Um, it's not like, I think when we say endurance, it's almost, it's not like we um, we see it as, a, as suffering. I think the fundamental thing is we see it as an opportunity. Um, when I talk to people in China to understand their perspective about the pandemic, it's almost like when they, there's a lockdown, they're all like really, um, what's the right word? there's energy in it. <laughs> there's like, they're ready for it. They're, they're happy. There's an opportunity for them to shine, to do this for everyone. Like this is part of a, collect a collectivism. But um, I just wanted to add on to that because I think uh, that's a fascinating um, um, point. Um, it's, um, I, I definitely agree. There are things um, Asians probably are slightly different from uh, non-Asians. Mm -hmm. Bona, yeah, I, I give you a light example. Yeah. <laughs> oh, sorry. I see you were so passionate about this. I just want to give you a tiny 30 seconds, maybe 15 seconds of a live example of your observation of individualism versus collectivism. I married a French Canadian. So in his language, my husband say I a lot. I say we a lot. So very often I say, hey, you're not an American individualist speaking, you know, <laughs> and he will be like, you're a Chinese collectivist speaking. So it's so funny. It's life in the house. So back to you, Sharon, you know, I just oh, want to offer that. Yeah, that's very, uh, very, very interesting anecdote. Uh, I appreciate you sharing some household uh, little stories. Um, I think my story is in terms of, I completely agree with you, individualism and collectivism. And also I think endurance is important as well. Um, I give you an example, uh, years ago when I bumped into my one of my coworkers who was white and you know, from Montreal. And then she, all of a sudden she brought up this, um, because at that time of the year, there was a news going on about how Ontario uh, administration students have failed in the standard math test, 60%, 60% at that year. It is horrendous. And then we had such a long talk about, she said, I don't understand Asian kids never fail in math, very, very rarely, in, both in Canada, in North America or in Asia. And I just don't understand, we, I think we fundamentally, we need to change the way that we're thinking about learning. It's learning from very decades ago, somebody created this idea, this theory, learning is all, all about fun. And then our educational system is built on this theory, built, built on this mentality that if kids are feel like too squished, 
too pressured, then that means we need to release the pressure. We need to we need to lower the standard. We need to let them to have more fun. When, in one part, I feel the Western and the, and the Eastern culture are clashing in this way. I think uh, in today's Asian countries, they do need to take this a little bit of mentality to bring into their system because the pressure is really, really high. They're all, every single kid is working on the, you know, in the pressure cooker, basically. But however, we are in this society, we need a little bit push. We need a little bit higher standard. We need a little bit of self motivation for kids to grow, to, to learn more. And so that's something that is quite, quite interesting. I think this also go back to our roots is any, nothing. Um, I remember when I was a kid, we were told you can do anything. It's if you couldn't, if, if you fail, that means you didn't put enough effort into it. And this is the belief that we grew up with. That's why we could survive in the completely foreign country because nothing is impossible. And as long as we put in enough work, enough effort, we will make it happen. I think that strength coming from this mentality is childhood education and embedded in our DNA. Uh, it's so funny. It reminds me of the book you probably remember, The Tiger Mom. Uh, being yeah. <laughs> I am not one of them. I swear. <laughs> Stereotypical Asian mom. I think um, part of it is, you know, passing the torch of the endurance and maybe the collectivism for the good of the family, do something that contributes to society. But it's also, I think, a form of caring, right? That we really want to do our absolute best and put our best foot forward. So diversity now has become a really common term, like in the workplace. Um, it's a term that we like to think about diversity and inclusion. And each of you have shared stories about how you've taken your own personal strength to really forge your own path. But what do you think about whose responsibility it really is to be the champion of this diversity? Do we have to all take it upon ourselves as minorities or as Asian Canadians to be the ones that lead the charge? Or should that responsibility also belong to governments or companies or individuals? And maybe I can start with Helen and your role as HR. I mean, hiring is probably the core of what diversity is right now in the, in the workplace today. What are your thoughts? Yeah, for me, it's, I can confidently say it's everybody's responsibility. Right, and I, I truly believe um, everyone is a leader, regardless you have a title uh, of a leader or not, or we have a team reporting to you, we're all leaders in a country or in an organization or in a community or in a household. If you're a parent, you're a leader, right? And, and it's all of our responsibilities to share the right values. I know we talk about Black, uh, black Lives Matter, um, we talk about anti-Asian hate, I want to call out is regardless of race, of ethnicity, of background, we all should share the common uh, fundamental values, which is, you know, respect each other, right, equally with, with that dignity. So I think that's the value that everyone should share with the people around them. And if a, a president of a country, they ha he has to know, he has tremendous influence, so his behavior is going to matter. If you're a parent in a household, how you teach your children to treat other people nicely, right? So how, you know, that behavior is going to be seen. That's fundamental. So all of us, um, regardless, I think you should have that responsibility. And yes, we do hire people, diverse talent, you know, in the organization. And we look, look at how we move the needle to actually get the organization, um, in a more inclusive environment so that we can attract people with diverse, um, not just cultural background or experiences, but also school of thought. Because that's the way to actually enhance, right, the strength of an organization to be whole, holistic, to be more innovative. So that's kind of my personal point of view. Fabulous. And I'd like to um, pass this question on to Kathy. Because I think you also see how companies are are thinking about being more diverse in their marketing. And whose responsibility do you think it is to champion diversity? I I agree with um, what Helen has just said. I, I think you said it so so, so well. Um, I do think uh, on a higher level, the government and the businesses have a responsibility, but it comes to 
it comes down to individuals. But I'll, I'll comment on the, um, the, the business side first. Um, so in Canada and the US at least, um, multiculturalism very often in marketing we have we use models which is called acculturation models which means like for newcomers to what extent you get assimilated to the hosting country um, that is almost like an index to the assumption is the longer you are in this country the more acculturated you become but I think uh, going back to um, the comments um, we heard early on, um, I actually happened to co-author a book called Migration Nation. Um, it's um, basically uh, all the good learnings um, we had from doing research um, across different cultural groups. So what in that book, we had a model, um, uh, like an immigrant uh, journey kind of model. The ultimate stage, it's definitely not acculturated immigrants don't want to be acculturated as their ultimate goal. The ultimate goal is to, to have the freedom to, to choose easily, comfortably between identities, to know, like to feel comfortable with myself, to know in different, this kind of situation, I could be the best version of this version of myself, that version of myself. So I, th I thought that's that's just very, um, that, like it's, everything seems to come together. So acculturation, back to acculturation. What um, I also volunteered um, um, my time um, in the past few years with a program called uh, Business Edge at Rockman School of Management. Now the program is called Intercultural uh, Intercultural Skills Lab. Um, what they do is that they have a program. It's a, it's a fantastic program. To, they help uh, internationally trained professionals succeed in Canada. So through that program, we built a tool called Maple, Maple like Canada Maple. Uh, Maple stands for Mutual Acculturation Profile and Learning Engine. So that concept of mutual acculturation, it's part of the work that uh, Rockman does. I think I'm sure Helen uh, would agree with me. We have learned that uh, it's not about immigrants acculturating to the hosting country. It's also about um, companies in Canada acculturate towards the newcomers. So it's a mutual acculturation. So I think all that is in theory. I think a lot of companies are doing a lot of good work on that. I, I do firmly believe though, it is come, it is at the end, the individual. Um, I come from a city, Shanghai, where um, not racism, but uh, prejudice is just everywhere. Really, it's not it's not a foreign concept, even though everyone is the same. Um, there is significant prejudice. We grew up with that. Uh, it's almost like a natural part of, of, of you. It's almost like it's impossible for you not to look down upon certain area in this city. Like it's just part of human nature. Um, I, I feel like um, in Canada, this is such a, a like beautiful, beautiful place. Uh, it's not about race, it's about everything. It's about uh, LGBTQ community, for example. It's about people people, people with diversity, uh, like uh, disability, for example. At the end, it's the same thing. It's about some groups of people that are just um, maybe less privileged, um, less represented. Um, so it's, it's, it's about everything. I feel like um, it's about training of the mental muscle to, to, to be aware of that and then to fully embrace that because at the end, we individually feel better. We live a better life. We, um, it's, it's, it, it can only come from within, I feel like. Then maybe that mutual acculturation can actually happen. Uh, probably too long an answer, but uh, yeah, that's a, that, that's a very important topic. No, that's great. Thank you for sharing your expertise and perspective. And with that, I think, um, like Sharon, in your job as a producer at CBC, you're kind of the voice of Canada. And I think you see so many stories and you've also witnessed like how storytelling is changing in Canada. Like what's your, what's your view on how diversity can be championed by different actors in society? Oh, absolutely. Um, I think any social movement, any big changes we want to make, it's from bottom up. No one, God is not going to give you any opportunities or give you fairness or justice if you just wait. And that, so a government, no government is going to say, hey, now we need to pass the anti-Asian bills. 
uh, we need to <laughs> we need to you know treat black people with more dignity. We need to stop uh, profiling, and we need to you know um, recognize the indigenous land and the indigenous rights. These are all because of a fight, years and years of generations and generations fight. So what I'm thinking is from individual. Each one has our value we, we can add. We have our contribution and talent. So in a newsroom setting, I can see in 2006, when I first joined the CBC, which is the, the, the country's only national public broadcaster, we have our mandate, which is reflect our culture, our Canadians today in today's world. So at that time, because immigrants, I can see, we could but program went one year without mentioning an immigrant story. If, if there is immigrant story, that means something really bad happened in that community. Um, and then provoke the social outrage. Or, um, you know, we are not going into any, uh, to just like, uh, sorry. <laughs> you need to go, honey? <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't know. <laughs> Okay, can you go, please? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so, um, sorry about that. Um, this is working from home. <laughs> I'm just close to the door now. Um, let's move to. Oh, are you coming back? Yes, I'm back. Um, so, uh, what, what I'm thinking is, um, in the newsroom setting, that we have a lot of uh, because at that time we can see when you walk in the newsroom, CBC newsroom is really big, and then you know it's like an open area. You don't see any people look like me. I was the only one when I when when I uh, got on the, um, the national um, is that our national pro, uh, flagship news program. I was the only uh, at that time. I was the only immigrant and then from uh, background from Asia, and the Chinese. So uh, I just feel like you know what it's a, it's a it's out of place feeling. But however, I'm glad that I'm there because I could provide some perspectives. Mm -hmm. One attempt they didn't listen to me. They just dismiss totally dismissive about my opinion, my story page. However more and more you pitch more and more and then your voice getting louder and louder and then you find a different way and then the other way I, I want to emphasize is you're trying to find allies there's always a lot of people who are different very diverse mentality but if you approach them they want to talk to you you make friends you make you get support and then they're your allies use allyship to champion for you, to advocate for your ideas, for your rights. And I think this is so important. I, I attended a, a leadership um, uh, course, uh, a one year course is, you know, run by the CBC and other media organization. Then I learned one thing is just then, you know, you're trying to, trying to figure out how to navigate the system and how to make friends, how to gain support. It's something that we need to learn is like life, 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 lifetime skill we need to, um, master. So, uh, and now fast forward 15 years later, we have so many diverse stories. When you can, when you open, turn on the CBC News Network, you not only see white people or white men, <laughs> you see each story, we have this mandate that we need to find in diverse voices. I remember a couple of years ago, there was a big discussion about real estate story. It's a very, very, very simple real estate story in Toronto. And in the story, we have four voices. That reporter did not find a diverse background. Every single one of them is white. It takes a lot of efforts if you just set up the camera on the Toronto street. It takes a lot of efforts to not see any people from diverse background. And then why is our national public story has to be everything white? So uh, this is a huge discussion internally at that time and promote so many changes in my organization. Now we have a diversity group, which is, you know, it's all non-white people. We have to discuss about all the com companies' policies, our programs, and there's an issue about reporting about our coverage. You know, right now it's Israel and Gaza, and a lot of a lot of people just you know question our our the impartiality of our uh, courage and this kind of push actually coming from internal from our employees from our own diverse background uh, reporters producers engineers you know editors cameramen so uh, I think we are in the moment that the climate has changed although sometimes the weather is not great 
<laughs> that's, <An analogy. laughs> but that's why we need to push it there are sunny days more sunny days than before still we need to uh, we, we need to be cautious and then we need to keep pushing it's yeah. a hard work Reality, especially um over the last few months where we've seen so much anti-asian sentiment right like the the climate is not great but progress is happening and it's great to hear yeah. now Mona, like you're in the finance industry that has this reputation for not being very inclusive but i'm i've observed since we're friends on linkedin that you're at one of the most inclusive firms um there seems to be can you tell us like about how maybe you can tell us even about Mackenzie a little bit and whose responsibility you see it as to champion diversity? Yeah, and I was gonna, I was, I'm really pleasantly surprised because when Ashley gave us questions, we, we kind of prepared the answers independently. So I, nobody knows what other people are gonna say. And just such a pleasant surprise that all of us chose that it is individual responsibility um, um, by and large. So I, I share the views of I echo all the ladies' um, um, opinions because even like Ashley mentioned, I'm in an organization that really battles um, diversity and from top down, everybody is working hard to, to empower women. And I can feel that firsthand, it's with firsthand experience. But also I've seen that because with my own career, you know, I have my struggles and my down points, but you know, in this toughest moment or darkest hour, you cannot just go online and, and go through your company's policy and think all oh, the problem will be solved. So when, whenever there's such moments or challenges, there's always has to be some person, some people or some person, some individuals that will lend you a hand, who will give you some advice or point you to the, to the right direction. So there's always going to be the people who has been implementing those, those policies. And also, if you think about any organization or even a government, um, I have to say sometimes is the, the leader's um, opinion matters and the, and the leader is an individual with him or herself. Um, so at McKinsey, we have great programs. Number one is a mentor program that you can partner up with a, with a different female leaders in the organization and ask for advice from time to time. And secondly is, is a kind of visibility program. So we have this interview series that interviews all the female employees within the firm to talk about their career um, um, journey, to talk about their personal life, their insights. I think it's, it's very important because you cannot be when you cannot see. When you don't have a voice, it's hard to really have a position in the industry. So, but ultimately it comes down to the person. I will give you an example. Um, recently, there has been a real change, I think, in, a, in the Toronto's financial industry. There's been a lot more promotions um, of women across firms. But as one of my best friends had, had been struggled to get a promotion. She's very experienced, just her performance is top notch. Um, and I believe her firms have some sort of a supportive um, initiatives setting in. But I think it, only, it ultimately comes down to the person. She has to, to own that process. She has to be proactive. She has to stand up for herself and, and voice her, her, her desires. So um, that's why I feel like it's ultimately the individual's um, responsibility will have to own this, especially coming from a collective <laughs> culture. We have to sort of have this ownership of our life. Yeah. Well, thank you for highlighting some of these, like it sounds like really innovative to me and um, exciting practices to kind of push diversity forward. And maybe Helen can contribute on this side because you're in the HR arena. What are what are some of the practices and policies that, that really help um, push diversity, but also create paths for leadership for, for minorities like Asians in the workplace these days? Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion become more of a key priority for many organizations. Uh, right now, um, I just take my uh, organization as an example. We have publicly declared um, the ambition to have gender parity in 2030, and also, you know, 30% of a minority in the VPs and above position. So, so that's kind of like a, a public declaration. It's a small step, we're not measuring diversity inclusion just by the numbers, but you know this is the initial step because they're going to pay attention to what kind of talent we're attracting, what kind of a, a talent we're going to bring into the organization, and how we actually uh, put forward some developmental uh, programs for the diverse talent already in your organization. Um, so far, I haven't heard a lot of specific programs targeting at Asians only, but I would say it's uh, visible minority at large. 
uh, we generate a lot of attention. And there are a lot of data analytics lead us to think, what are some of the reasons behind certain phenomena? For example, we have done some research we find in the organization, there are a lot of diverse talents below director level. So when it hit the direct level and all the way up to AVP, VP, and even more senior, we have a fewer and fewer uh, visible minority. So the question mark is why, right? So we're trying to um, dig deeper in the root causes. And of course, there are some hypotheses, right? There are um, barriers around maybe it's vis visibility and exposure, whether the visible minority are good at personal branding and given um, the opportunity to shine a certain platform. Mm -hmm. uh, another one, I think Mona, you mentioned mentoring, right? So whether you have uh, mentoring your organization or ally in your organization who can help you pave the way and broaden that network, right? That could be, it could be culture barrier. We know it's not just the cultural background, it's also how you navigate in a corporate culture, right? Versus navigating a startup culture. So all these different um, uh, reasons could also be in some cases, simple like language. I've heard so many uh, people who told me saying, English is not my first language. And sometimes I'm formulating my beautiful phrases to answer a question, but when I'm ready, the topic's gone, right? <laughs> and my manager think I never contribute to the conversation because I'm so quiet. And it's not that. How you actually help them to actually maybe overcome those barriers and say, hey, I do have insight. Maybe I'm not speaking at the moment, but you know, I actually write you an email with all my points to show that I am um, someone who can uh, provide input to the, to the conversation. So there are a lot of different um, so-called hypothesis on why, right? We're limited to a certain level uh, of position. So I think I definitely like what Mona said, own your own career. Uh, I often share this with my um, mentees that no one cares about your career development more than yourself. So you know yourself better than anyone else. You know where you want to go, uh, what you want to become, and we can help you define the how, right? You have to tell me you want to go to Africa, then we can actually say, you know, whether we're going to go there by, by airplane or by ship or whatever. So don't count your like manager to be the only person who's going to pay attention to your career. Your manager will be a resource. Your manager can give you the wheel, but you have to be the driver. So that's, that's why I totally uh, agree with you on your career. Fabulous. Well, you know, believe it or not, almost an hour has gone by since we began the conversation. <laughs> Um, I want to thank all four of you for sharing your personal stories. They're all stories of resilience, of overcoming obstacles, of making and creating a space for yourself and kind of seizing your careers and driving forward. So tonight in the audience, we know WeWorking Women is a massive online network. It has over 100,000 followers and we have people chiming in from all over. But I would like to ask you to give a little bit of thought to the advice you might be giving to your 20 year old self um, as an Asian in the workplace, in a multicultural workplace, you know, what are some things that you wish you would know? And, and if you feel like it's um, a bit more accessible, you should keep in mind, there may be people that are later on in their career and are still facing these bottlenecks. So um, please like keep in mind what you might like to say. And maybe all, since we just had Helen, I'll jump up with Sharon and put you on the spot and give us some advice. Okay, so what I'm saying is, what would I say to the 20 year old me? I would say I will be more bold. I will encourage today's young people, the world is your oyster. So you just do whatever you want to do. What you, just trying to realize your vision by all means. Don't think about, don't let anything put you down. It's if you try, you know, maybe you'll fail. But if you don't try, you never know what will happen. So I just think a lot of things when I was my young age, although I, I, I made a lot of bold decisions, that's why I'm here right now. But there's a, along the way, there's something sometimes I just feel, 
oh, I'm a little bit shy or a little bit, you know, hesitate to try. Um, am I enough? Am I prepared? Am I ready for that? You know, you can never be ready for being a parent. A lot. <laughs> you just, you just have to be right. Just when your babies come, you know, you are your mother automatically. So a lot of things in life is like that. You just have to, you just have to deal with it. And you just have to put efforts and don't be afraid. You don't have time to be afraid of anything. If you have that time and energy, put in the work. <laughs> and yeah, put in the ambition, more ambition in yourself. And the other thing I want to mention is we are in a very, very good era, I would think. Uh, in my 15, 16 years here, I just feel that the time has changed. There's no way that we go back. Before, our voice is muted. It's partially because we are not afraid of saying, speaking out, and also other people don't listen. As the moment that we open our mouth, the people are just dismissed our opinions, right, without even listening to. But now they can't because the climate changed. So a lot of organizations, we have a diversity and inclusion department initiative programs. We develop a nurture, um, you know, leaders from different background. We have, a, for example, at CBC last year, we came up with this uh, uh, policy that one out of every three hirings in CBC has to go to BIPOC community, Black, Indigenous, people of color. If you make it as a mandate, as a requirement, you will you will see the whole newsroom face change. The newsroom face change means your program change. Your program change means your audience change. So that's, we are living in a very, very, I, I'm very po positive and, um, you know, passionate about the changing and then the, the way that we're going. Along the way, there's a lot of bumpy roads, a lot of hiccups, there's a lot of ups and downs, doesn't matter. That's that's called a process. That's called a life. So enjoy it. <laughs> Thank you so much. Fabulous advice. Um, so many inspiring tidbits. Let's move on to Kathy. Kathy, what advice would you give to your 20 year old self? I would try to be today's 20 year old, to be honest. I think today's 20 year old, they don't look at race. They don't they don't see it. They just live in such a multicultural society. They live in a more tolerant society. They don't see it. They're not conscious of it. I felt like uh, one of my barriers, it's an internal barrier. I couldn't just forget that it was different from most of my colleagues. Uh, mm -hmm. That was a huge barrier uh, that helped me back for a very long time. Even though other people felt like I was doing well, I knew that I wasn't comfortable. I knew that uh, I was okay doing my work. My work time was my best time. I didn't want to go out um, with my colleagues for lunch, for, like team activity. That's the that's the worst of everything that we. Uh, yeah, I think it's that it's a unnecessary um, worry that I, it was just it was so heavy on my mind. I just felt like I wasted so much energy. But gradually, you learn, right? You gradually became comfortable. And gradually, I realized, yeah, actually, you could do that. You don't have to even think about it. You just focus on doing what you're good at. So I felt like if I could uh, um, go back, um, I would have stopped worrying myself, just like today's 20-year-old. I think, um, like uh, Sharon said, right now, it's a very good time. It's a good time in a way that I find the whole idea of compassion is just everywhere. Um, I do believe in that. I believe um, I like this whole othering is part of compassion. If we keep thinking about them versus us, me versus them, keep thinking about the differences, um, that's just not good for every everyone, anyone. Um, so I think this whole movement is coming. Um, people are, it's also like part of survival, really. Um, the modern society, all the anxiety, depression, like all that. Um, we have come to realization there needs to be something that removes that separation. It's not about good for the society. It's about at the end, it's good for ourselves. We, we come to that peace of mind. We come to um, this peace that we come to find ourselves. So yeah, I adore this generation, the fact that can, they can do that. So that would be the, the advice for myself. Great, more, lots to learn from the young people of today. So Mona, what about you? What advice would you give to your 20 year old self? I, I agree with both um, Sharon and Kathy said, I think um, I don't want to be two parts. Number one is stay true to who you are. 
And number two is try to do your best to, to help others. Um, I think the first part really comes from my, my personal experience because um, I have a lot of doubts about myself when I was younger and I didn't know whether what I want is, is, is granted or um, is achievable. But I actually think like, 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 like um, Sharon said, this is the best time. If, if we think about our grandmothers um, or our mom's generation, I think they face a lot more obstacles as women and also as Asian women as well. But I, I think I'm the luckiest generation. So there is so much we could do. So stay true to who, to who you are. And also one of my mentors ever told me that life is a great adventure. So there will be hiccups along the way. Eventually you grow out of it. So that's sort of my, my attitude toward, towards life. But also, secondly, I recently, especially recent years, um, talking to you guys, being working along you guys, and also kind of making friends with all the women that I've um, known re in recent years, have helped me to um, understand that there is whoever in a position to help others, we have an obligation to to support and help other people. And there's tr tr tremendous joy in enabling other people. Um, nobody's an island, and I think. Um, it's really, it's really about you know all of us can get a better life. That's a, that's a tremendous um, gratifying feeling. So I would tell her um, to stay true to who you are and help others. Thank you, Mona. And um, finally, Helen, tell us what advice would you give the younger version of yourself? I think I'm going to give three advice. Number one, be bolder, try new things, make mistakes, hit your head on the wall. The more mistakes you make in your 20s, you probably the less mistakes you're going to make in your 40s. <laughs> Second, yeah. Second is uh, learn new things. Don't limit yourself. Be open-minded. My mom actually says, you know, um, the skills or language you learn, you can put in the back pocket. No one can take those away from you. So I always remember that. And some people will say, oh, this is my area of expertise. I'm going to learn it. No, learn more. I think you'll be fascinated if you'll find um, uh, a scientist that can play piano beautifully, right? So, so just explore um, different areas, broaden um, the, the horizon and learn new things. And the last one I would say, um, regardless you have money or not, travel. Travel to many places, as many places as you can, see the world, meet different people, you're gonna discover the world is so big and we're so small. And that's gonna actually shape your mind in such a, a rich way. So I'm gonna stop. Those are some of the advices I'll give to myself. Back to you, Ashley. Oh, well, thank you so much. This has been amazing advice. Um, you've emphasized being bolder. You've emphasized the importance of giving back. And the four of you have shared so much of yourselves with us this evening in Canada and morning in China, your personal stories, your insights, your thoughts. And I think your encouragement um, to viewers that are tuning in from all over the place. Thank you for being here to celebrate Asian Heritage Month. Um, everyone, thank you so much for joining us. You are watching We Working Women live. We Working Women, again, is North America's largest online platform for the professional development of Chinese women. And we've been proud to celebrate Asian Heritage Month with you. May you all find strength in your heritage and lead diversity in the workplace like these fabulous four role models we've had today. Thank you so much, Kathy, Helen, Sharon, and Mona. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. Have a good day, have a good evening, everyone.